Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello everybody, this is Dr. Grande. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. Ken Rosenthal, who is here to answer a variety of questions about the coronavirus. So just a quick background on Dr. Rosenthal. He is a virologist and immunology professor at Augusta University, University of Georgia Medical Partnership. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of Delaware and a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He also completed a postdoctoral education in tumor virology and immunology at Harvard Medical School and the Dana-Farber Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being with me today here, Dr. Rosenthal. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Of course, you know, the big story now is the coronavirus, and there are a lot of questions about the characteristics of this virus, how we develop a vaccine, all these anxieties and concerns. And your education, of course, is exactly what people are looking for in terms of trying to find answers to these questions. So uh, I'm really appreciative that you could come on here, and I have a few questions for you uh, on this topic. Um, I'll be glad to answer them to the best of my ability. One of the things that um, I can add to that is my research most recently has been on vaccines and uh, viruses. And uh, we just initiated uh, discussions of a unique type of um, vaccine for COVID-19, uh, which who knows? We'll see how it progresses. Well, that's good news. That's good news. So kind of on that topic, my first question is really around the process of developing a vaccine. So can you discuss that process, how long that takes? Does the process take a certain amount of time, no matter how many people are working on it? Or is it more of like a trial and error type of thing? Well, the, um, the Chinese were very very good about uh, publishing the sequence of this particular uh, coronavirus very soon after the, they acknowledged the outbreak. Um, and with the sequence, um, many groups could proceed very quickly to initiate research into development of vaccines and other therapies. The um, First thing that was noted was that the this particular coronavirus that causes COVID-19, and the virus actually is called SARS-CoV-2 to distinguish it from the previous SARS, which uh, that was about 10, 15 years ago, um, also from China, and probably also originated in a similar way from a bat virus that jumped to an intermediate intermediate animal and then from there to humans but let's get, getting back to the story about vaccines once the sequence was identified and its similarities to SARS and MERS there are several approaches that could be initiated very quickly. One was to develop a vaccine based on the gene um, to make a DNA vaccine or an RNA vaccine. This is an RNA virus, but you can still make a vaccine from a copy uh, of DNA that looks like the RNA or a, an RNA that has pieces of the virus SARS virus RNA. And then other ways is to take, and um, since the proteins sequences were identified, make those proteins or pieces of the proteins called peptides, and then use them as vaccines. Now the first vaccines that were initiated and um, are in trials are called RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines. For these vaccines, part of the 
genetic sequence of the virus, encoding only pieces of the virus, proteins of the virus, not the whole virus, but just certain proteins are put into the DNA of a vaccine. That DNA is made in yeast or other cells and then purified. And then the DNA itself or RNA itself bearing genes of the virus, but not the whole virus, are then injected as the vaccine. The body picks up, the cells in the body pick up the RNA or DNA, and it the RNA or DNA in the vaccine tells these cells to make the viral protein, and then the viral protein is recognized by the immune system of the body and initiates an immunization. The development of these vaccines proceeded very, very quickly because the, the technology was available. The uh, genes can be plug and play, meaning you take the gene out of the virus or you synthesize the, the gene and then you just put it into the what's called a vector and then use that as your means to immunize an individual. The DNA and RNA vaccines can be uh, synthesized quickly and in large quantity. And um, they're easy uh, to make and they're relatively stable and um, easy to um, distribute. So these are the va vaccines that are in clinical trials as of now. Um, as I said before, another approach is to take and make peptides, small pieces of the viral proteins, and use them as a vaccine. And that's what um, the group that I work with is, is doing. And then these are, are used to immunize um, individuals. And again, they're relatively easy to make and to standardize and then um, initiate the appropriate immune responses. Okay, backing up a, one step. How long will this take? Well, when I say things are in trials, that means that the first step is to see, are they safe? So you can't take anything for granted. So it's very important to show that the immunization is not going to cause harm. And so the first step is a small trial to determine that the vaccine itself is safe, number one, and then initiates the expected immune response. Now, I call it this the immune response because at no time will those volunteers who get the test vaccine, at no time will they be infected with the virus. So for them, it's just, let's see what type of immune response they make. Do they make antibodies? Do they make uh, cell mediated immunity, meaning white blood cells that deal with the infection? What happens after the immunization? How soon does it occur? And if there's time, how long does it last? That probably, that process is probably coming to the point where the first trial, where they're actually determining if the vaccine is working. And probably the answers can be obtained about safety and immunogenicity within a month or two. Okay. So, so at that point, if, if in a month or two, when there's some information, what's the timeline look from there on out? Say it. Say it's a, a good response. So let's say the, the response was good. 
then they would probably move to a phase two trial. And um, in that, they would immunize a large number of people who um, have the potential to get infected and compare their safety, uh, their protection to the general population. Since there's no treatments for this virus as of yet, it is not ethical to test the, these volunteers by infecting them. So it would have to be a natural type of scenario where you immunize a, pop, a large population and then you check to see how well they're protected from a normal exposure situation. Um, so that might, those volunteers might include people who are at risk now and who have not been infected yet. So they might be um, delivery people, um, people who are still working, for example, um, as opposed to the many of us who are quarantined in their own homes. Um, that trial could take a while. Okay. That take, um, I'm going to suggest six months to a year. And that's the but phase if, two, right? Yeah. But if the um, if the safety and the immunogenicity looked so good, then um, there might be pressure to push that phase two trial to include a much larger uh, contingent. Um, and that would essentially cover pe people who are thought to be at higher risk. Um, so it might be a year before we actually see the first of these vaccines. Now, backing up with one step, RNA vaccines, DNA vaccines, and these peptide vaccines have have not become mainstream for human vaccines. The technology is established. The um, trials have been done and shown to be effective in humans, but there are no commercial vaccines that are in those forms. So this would jumpstart their um, use in in the human population. So this would be potentially the application of a new technology. That's correct. This is bringing new technologies to the core. That's amazing. So the phase one's going on now, phase two could start soon, and then we're looking at about a year. That's correct. And then after phase two is complete, does it go right to distribution? If, if, it, if it gets to that place, I think the pressure would be to push it out sooner than later. Yes. So you mentioned this when you were talking about the vaccine, about a cure, which of course is a whole other angle, another way to approach this. And we've heard this talk of like, I guess it was a drug that was used for malaria that's being considered and all this. Is a cure a possibility, or is a vaccine definitely going to outpace any type of cure? Well, um, there are a couple of drugs that have been, a few drugs that have been tried. The hydroxychloroquine that you're talking about, the malarial drug, it, it's been talked about for viruses for quite some time. It may prevent the virus from getting into the cell. Um, the virus would be able to bind and sort of trick the cell into getting it in, but then the hydroxychloroquine prevents it from moving any further to cause a problem in the cell, meaning initiate replication. So it gets stuck at that stage and then the cell can oftentimes degrade it and stop the infection. Hydroxychloroquine also affects 
the immune response to cut back a little bit on the infl inflammation, which is a major component of this viral disease. There are a couple of other antiviral drugs for other viruses that are being tested on this one. However, viruses are very, each virus is very, very different from other, other viruses. And so it's really tricky to find a drug that works on one virus and still works on another. So there's a lot of attempts at that story. Another totally different approach that's being used is to treat individuals to tone down the inflammatory response that is associated with this particular virus infection. So that drugs which are used, very expensive drugs, that are used for um, autoimmune disease, inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like psoriasis, these drugs are being tried as well on individuals who are starting to show symptoms to try to cut back on the extent of the inflammatory response that's part of the disease. So this, this in essence could be a treatment to where somebody who may have expired because the illness would survive because the inflammation is reduced? That's correct. It's um, very briefly, the virus infects the cells of the lower lung and initiates the production of cytokines that these cytokines are immune hormones. And these cytokines then turn on inflammatory responses and then initiate the recruitment of white blood cells called neutrophils to initiate in a very big inflammatory response. The virus kills some of these lung cells directly and then the immune response this inflammatory response, which gets tricked into being activated, try, starts killing other cells. And that causes a lot of problems. In addition, as part of the inflammation, fluid leaks out of the capillaries of the lung into the lung. And it's like you causing a person to almost drown in their own fluids um, in a way that we call pneumonia. And then the combination of this can cause serious, seriously compromised lung function, make it extremely difficult to breathe. And that is a major component of this, uh, the disease process, COVID-19 which is the name of the disease that SARS-CoV-2 causes. So with this particular coronavirus, kind of the mechanism of death, I guess, would often involve something respiratory. The, the mechanism of death starts in the lung, and it creates something called... Um, creates the initial inflammatory response in the lung, but then because of that inflammatory response and the cytokines that are produced, the response then moves to other organs. The cytokine response can cause something called shock, due to the um, release of fluids out of the vascular, out of our circulatory system into the body. And then it becomes difficult for the cells and material in the blood to move throughout the body and get to where it needs to go. 
and therefore other organs can fail. And so it, this all starts in the lung, but it can progress to a multi-organ failure. So it's not just restricted to suffocation. It could also be, as you said, a lot of organs having difficulty functioning. That's correct. But the initial, the initial step is you have to keep the person breathing. Otherwise, there's, there's no other hope for the rest of it. Wow. So, so this uh, coronavirus has the capacity to be dangerous in a few different ways. So pretty scary, and it seems kind of complex in terms of treatment because there wouldn't be really a treatment protocol already initiated for this, right? We don't have a standard treatment. No, there is not a standard treatment, but the approach that is used for treatment is a similar approach that's used for pneumonia and other inflammatory diseases of the lung. One of the big questions, and I have the same question, why is it that some people are more prone than others? Now, Obviously, if the lung doesn't function well, if a person has difficulty repairing the lung, and that usually means older individuals, if the person is prone to inflammation, these kinds of things might are likely to make that individual susceptible to the serious outcome. But there are others who seem to also suffer uh, serious outcomes for unknown reasons. Now, children usually have a much milder inflammatory response to viruses than adults. And we know this because they can get mono, they can get hepatitis B infections, and almost have no symptoms. Whereas adults, they have serious symptoms. And similarly, for them, this infection may just be a serious cold, a flu-like disease, and then they get better. Yeah, so we see a wide variety of responses. So the illness seems preferential to medical comorbidity, like you talked about, and age. But then sometimes people who seem to be at low risk can have a severe response. And this is true for any disease. There are genetic bases and situations, exposures and bad luck that, you know, pervade that we just don't know about for any much. Yeah, so there's some permanent parts of the field that are a mystery. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, colds and the flu as you were talking about coronavirus. And I was wondering, and we've seen this on the news a few times, is there the potential for coronavirus to become kind of a seasonal event? Well, that would be nice. It would be good and it would be bad. I don't have any reason to believe that it would, should become seasonal. Um, the reason that influenza seems to be seasonal has to do with people coming indoors and greater exposure and also the humidity issues and temperature issues of indoor versus outdoor. There doesn't seem to be the same restriction with this virus. The only difference, the only similarity is that their influenza and this virus are transmitted in aerosol droplets. And so close proximity promotes transmission because the aerosol droplets are in the air for a distance and a certain amount of time. And with this particular virus, the I believe it's called the R naught. I guess the potential to be contagious is quite a bit higher than we've seen from 
like the cold or flu? The R naught for this virus is, let's say, about two to three times that of influenza, in part because everybody is susceptible. And then anybody who gets infected has the potential to infect two, three, or more people that they come in contact with during the time that the virus is replicating their lungs even before symptoms occur. So somebody could be healthy and energetic and still transmit the virus. That's the scary thing about this. Um, because um, this, this particular virus has an incubation period of 4 to 14 days. And in that time, an individual may be shedding the virus. And so, and they wouldn't even know that they are sick. And so, um, it's, it's an unknown. And then on top of that, there are people who will down uh, play the significance of sniffles or a sore throat, a mild fever, because they have an obli- they feel they have an obligation to work or something. And then they put others at risk. So even in, since in uh, instances where they could have some symptoms, they may dismiss them because they're so similar to uh, illnesses that aren't very dangerous, like the cold. Well, you know, that goes back to one of the, the strange things about this story. The human coronavirus, not SARS, is a common, common cause of the common cold. How many comments can I use? But it really is a routine cause of common cold. So the difference being the benign coronavirus only replicates above the um, in the upper respiratory tract where it's cooler. But this virus, SARS, can replicate down in the base of the lung because of temperature. Because there's a temperature difference between those two areas of the lung? So the yeah, in the upper, in the nose, in the upper respiratory tract, because the air is coming from the outside, the temperature is like 34 degrees centigrade, let's say 90, 90-ish or lower. Um, and then, but at the base of the lung, it's body temperature, 98.6. And the common cold viruses don't, can't uh, grow down there. So they're restricted by the, the physiology of the lung, and the coronavirus right. sounds like it's much less restricted in terms of opportunities to, to reproduce. The SARS coronavirus is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So as we talk about the transmission, of course, there's been a lot of emphasis here on the social distancing. You talked about that before. And the flattening the curve, which is designed to prevent medical systems like hospitals from being overwhelmed. Can social distancing, considering how contagious this illness is, is it really making a difference in the total number of people infected? Are we kind of delaying the inevitable? I firmly believe that we are reducing the spread of the virus, but this is, I think it's a temporary situation. Ultimately, we have to build up what's called herd immunity. Enough people who have been infected, who have antibodies, either because they were infected and got better, or they were vaccinated, in order for the virus to be unable to find a host who is susceptible. So this so, is a percent of the population that has to be immune by some mechanism. So they either had it before or they're vaccinated. Right. So for measles, which is very, very, very contagious, 90% of the population has to be immunized to prevent the spread of the virus. And then, very different from this virus, 
infants and very young children are still susceptible until they can get the vaccine. But with this virus, it's the adult population, the old, older adult population, that are at greatest risk. And I fear that until we have a vaccine, that will remain. Yeah, so with herd immunity, <clears throat> children who are too young to receive the vaccination essentially are vaccinated by other people's behavior, by the fact that adults are immune, as long as that percentage is high enough. Right. Because it reduces their chance of exposure. But with this virus, this is flipped around to where children really aren't particularly vulnerable. But as you indicated, age seems to be something that predicts vulnerability. That's correct. Yeah. But, but, um, what might be very, very helpful is if children get the, the infection and get over it. It's kind of like once upon a time, we used to um, send our children over to somebody who had chickenpox. So they would get it. It would be mild, and then they would be immunized. Similarly, with children, um, if they get it, it'll be mild, and then we have a popular, they won't be spreaders anymore. The problem with both of those situations is those rare cases where a children, a child has some predisposition that makes them susceptible to serious disease. And then good intent goes sour. Right, so with, well, as you mentioned, with all viruses, I guess there's a risk of that, that somebody can have an atypical response, a really bad response when you wouldn't expect them to. That's correct. And magnified, of course, here, because nobody has immunity coming into this. And that's why the vaccines that are being developed, which have no infectious material at all, are safe and will do the job of providing immunity. But we have to wait until they're ready, unfortunately. So when the vaccine is ready, and I think this is an important point, I know older vaccines, like many, many years ago, they used sometimes a weakened version of the same illness and a very small percentage of the population could actually develop the infection. With this vaccine, you're saying nobody can actually develop the infection from the vaccine. That's correct. Um, this is, there's several, the vaccine you talked about, which is called an attenuated vaccine, which is what's used for measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella zoster would never be used in this situation. A vaccine like the flu vaccine, which is made from the virus itself, and then the virus proteins are isolated from the virus itself, that's not going to be the approach that's taken. The vaccines that are in development are going to be genetically engineered or synthesized um, chemical. Okay, so they're they're not even uh, part. They don't even come from that virus. They're not like you had That's the virus in a lab and you took a piece of it. Right. Yes, they're all they're going to be synthetic. That's amazing. And I think a good message for those uh, people who are afraid, you know, they have kind of a fear of vaccines, believing they can develop an illness from the vaccines. That time has really been over for many years. Absolutely. Um, and, and the stories that have been told about those issues were proven to be fakes. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to go into it because somebody might pick up on it and start thinking, but uh, he, some, there are some people who like to make a name for themselves by putting down making up stories that are not valid and, and substantiated. Yeah, and, and those stories seem to have a disproportionately 
high impact compared to legitimate scientific studies, I've noticed. Yes, very true. Yeah. So I'd like to wrap up, I guess, on a positive note. It's, it's definitely a heavy topic. And I had a few questions about the construct of a virus itself, like the, the entity of a virus. Are viruses universally destructive, or can they ever do something positive? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because um, uh, one thing viruses do is they make us stronger immunologically uh, in some regards. If, if, you know, if you survive, then you, you have to be stronger in a sense. And they educate the immune system in that way. Um, there are viruses that are in us almost every one of us all the time that influence our, who we are. There's a virus that is part of our chromosomes called the endogenous retrovirus. And one of the proteins that this endogenous retrovirus makes is essential for the birth of a baby, baby for the production of the placenta. Um, now, there are also bacterial viruses called bacteriophage. And these bacteriophage can be used to kill off bad bacteria. And they, um, so that is something that people are looking at. So there are possible uses and positive aspects to viruses, but for the most part, we could do without them. <laughs> yeah, we could certainly do without this particular novel coronavirus. I think uh, this is particularly scary for a lot of people, and it's really changed a lot in terms of the economy. So uh, definitely this one can, can go away if possible, and yeah. I hope that will be soon based on what you're saying. Maybe a year, maybe a little bit more than a year, we can get ahead of this. Well, that, that would depending upon the pressure put by the federal government, the um, ability to um, go through the checklist that is necessary for safety, uh, and having enough money to push this fast, we could see this vaccine sooner than later. And that was that would certainly be marvelous. Money does make a difference. Yeah. So yeah. So there's a financial aspect. So the resources need to be committed to these different projects. That's very true. Fortunately, it seems that the federal government is putting their money where their mouth is, and also the regulatory agencies are facilitating the progression of the the vaccines. Well, that's outstanding. I hope that trend continues. So, Dr. Rosenthal, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and answering these questions. I could certainly appreciate how you must be busy, especially, again, kind of given your specialty and what's going on right now. Uh, so, again, thank you so much for offering this education. And thank you for having me and giving me an opportunity to do a little teaching. <laughs> Absolutely, anytime. So I want to thank everybody who's watching for all your questions that helped put this video together. As always, I hope you found this discussion to be interesting. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.